Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our discussion on a gaping hole in identity access management with SSH key inventor Tatu Lenin. We're excited to have the inventor and pioneer of SSH keys with us today. Some quick housekeeping. You'll find any handouts for the presentation on your dashboard under the handouts tab. You can access and download these at any time during the webcast. At the end of today's presentation, we'll be providing a Q&A session. So if you have any questions at any time during our webcast, please send them to us in your question box. Also, when you leave the webcast, there'll be a brief survey. We hope you'll take a few minutes to answer. If you have any questions or like more information, you can always talk, send us an email later on at info at sdsusa.com, or you can call us at 1-800-443-6183. Okay, uh, so let me go ahead and introduce our speakers today along with the agenda. I'm Yvonne Wheaton. I'll be your moderator today. I'm in the marketing department at SDS or Software Diversified Services. I'll be doing the introductions. It's my pleasure to introduce Bob Thomas from Enterprise Systems Media. Bob Thomas is the CEO and founder of Enterprise Systems Media and the publisher of the Enterprise Executive and Enterprise Tech Journal. For over 30 years, Enterprise Systems Media Inc. has been serving the information needs of IT professionals at Fortune 500 size enterprises throughout the world. Bob will be setting the stage for us today by sharing the results from a very recent 2017 data access and compliance survey. He has some rather eye-opening information about SSH and this ESM survey. Today we have the honor of hosting Tatu Lenin from SSH Communications Security. Tatu Lenin's founder and SSH fellow at SSH, is a cybersecurity pioneer with over 20 years of experience. He invented SSH, or Secure Shell, which is the plumbing used for managing most networks, servers, and data centers and implementing automation for cost-effective systems management and file transfers. He's also written several IETF standards and is the principal author of the NIST IR7966 and holds over 30 U.S. patents including some of the most widely used technologies and reliable telecommunications networks. He takes a broad view on cybersecurity and its implications for business and society. Nowadays, he focuses on advancing cybersecurity and permanently solving some of its biggest hurdles. Tattoo will be answering some questions posed by John Walsh from SSH that will expose concerns and hopefully heighten awareness of the gaping holes in identity access management, or IM. Today we also have Kali Eskalainen, Vice President of Platform Management from SSH Security Communications. Kali has over 15 years of experience in information security services, R&D, and product management. As the VP of Platform Management, Kali is responsible for delivering customer-driven and high-performance security solutions and services that protect our customers from critical data and infrastructures. Kali's combination of experience is ideal for understanding the market and customers' challenges and how those can be resolved in enterprise environments. So today, Callie will provide a brief overview of Universal Key Manager along with a demo so you can see the UKM product in action. We'll close the presentation with a Q&A session. Deb Hodson is also on the line with us today. Deb is a sales manager at SDS and has 30 plus years in the IT business, having been at IBM, HP, Candle, and now SDS, all in sales and consulting roles. Jimmy Mills from SSH will also be joining us later for Q&A. Okay, so let me have a few minutes of your time so I can tell you a little bit about software diversified services. SDS has been providing mainframe solutions to the market for over 30 years. Our headquarters are located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. SDS has over 20 enterprise-wide products, including ZOS, MVS, VSE, and VM mainframe systems and distributed products for more than 1,000 clients worldwide. Our flagship products are dedicated to network management, security solutions, and performance solutions. We're proud of our world-class support. SDS is a leading provider of enterprise infrastructure software for multiple platforms. Our development staff is continually providing rich, robust updates and enhancements to our products. The SSH product solution, SSH TechTIA for Secure FTP, has been part of our array of SDS Enterprise product offerings. We've added the Universal Key Manager, or UKM, along with Crypto Auditor to round out our SSH product line offerings. 
So remember, at the end of today's presentation, we'll be providing that Q&A session. If you have any questions, you can put them in the, your question box at any point. Bob will start us off with our 2017 data access and compliance survey results. Bob, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. We recently conducted the 2017 data access and compliance survey to gain insight into how readers are protecting access to data and the use of secure keys. I would like to present some of the findings from this survey to you now. Based on the definitions we provided for compliance and governance, you can see that the survey shows the mainframe group, in most cases, is subject to the same compliance and governance as the distributed computing group within a given company or organization. In reality, the number is probably close to 100%, but some respondents are probably unclear of the policy. Clearly, respondents realize that separation of duties is an important compliance consideration. Is this being done for secure shell or SSH credentials? How can you be sure, and how do you know? This is as important as any other policy you may have in place regarding separation of duties. While the explanations shown here are only a few of the many received in the survey, the methods described are inefficient and prone to error. Is checking a box on a compliance spreadsheet enough, or are people held accountable for results? Most people always answer this question with a no or don't know response. The reason is that the only way to truly know is with a tool to scan and monitor these environments. As you can see, 67% of respondents believe that RACF provides protection against insufficient privileged access governance. Just over half of the respondents indicated that they are tracking SSH access, including the usage of SSH keys, but a large number of respondents are not protecting these important credentials or don't know if they are. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Hello, my name is John Walsh and I'm the Director of System Z Product here at SSH. And I'm here with Tatu, one of the founders of Modern Cybersecurity, and he invented the SSH protocol. Hello, Tatu. Hi, John. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for coming. Uh, could you tell us more about how you came to invent the SSH protocol and why? It all started from a hacking incident in our university network. There's a password sniffer installed on one of the servers. It's connected to the backbone. And when it was found, there were thousands of usernames and passwords in its database, including several from my company at the time. So I started thinking about what could I do to safely use the network to connect between my home, my office at the university, and my company. And I started learning encryption and basically a few months later published SSH, which then really took off in a big way. So you taught yourself encryption. You didn't really know any encryption before this. No. I started from scratch. I was a database researcher at the time. That's really impressive. And this is one of the most widely accepted solutions. So obviously you did something right. It was successful because it was easy to use. It solved a real pressing problem. And it, and, and it was easy to use. You didn't have to know cryptography, and it worked without any centralized infrastructure. You still don't really have a public key infrastructure for every, for, for every host, even today. And we certainly didn't have any of that at that time. So did anyone take any of your data when they stole these passwords? That's not really known. I think that's kind of par for the course, though, isn't it? Because uh, as an attacker or a criminal, I don't really want someone to know um, that they've been compromised. They want to keep coming back and taking a little bit at a time, right? Yeah. Like, if you want to exfiltrate data, you want to do it slowly. We actually had a customer who detected an, an, an exfiltration case that was over SSH, and they just saw from, from their traffic logs that SSH traffic had increased by gigabytes per day, and wow. somebody was caught. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's so, they got too greedy. They tried to take too much at one time, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I believe that SSH was widely accepted, um, and it's an integral part of, of all enterprises today. Um, could you talk more about how widely used it is and, and what it's used for, 
environments today? Yeah, it's in every data center. It's used for for systems management. It comes with every Unix, every Linux, every Mac. Most routers are managed using SSH. A lot of hardware, storage devices, uh, even server hardware like IPMI ports typically support SSH. It's a systems management tool, file transfer tool. It's inside a lot of configuration management systems, emergency response systems, and, and, and a lot of software used to manage large IT environments efficiently. So, so what's really the, the key part of the SSH protocol? Like what's, what's involved with SSH? How does it work? It encrypts all the traffic so that nobody can eavesdrop what you do and it protects the integrity of the traffic. It authenticates both the server and the user. So it's mutual authentication so that nobody can sit in the middle and uh, gain access to the, the encrypted content. That's the essence of it. And then it can be used for file transfers, it can be used for remote command execution. It's often integrated into other software products under the hood as the protocol that they actually use for file transfers or, uh, or other management operations. And sysadmins use it all the time. So, so how would I connect from one machine to another? Do I use a password when using SSH? So normally you'd just say SSH and the name of the host that you want to connect to. And uh, then it will prompt you for a password. But if you want to use it for automation, which is extremely common, we have some customers with more than 5 million daily logins, all automated using SSH. Then you use something called SSH keys, which is a cryptographic mechanism for authentication. It, was used for, it can be used for single sign-on, it can be used for automation. It's extremely handy and, 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 and secure by design. It's secure by design, okay. Um, are there any issues with using SSH keys? Yeah, well, when I designed it, I never figured somebody could have over a million SSH keys in their environments. We now have some customers with several million SSH keys in their legacy environments. That's like mind-boggling. And they've been accumulating over the last 20 years. They've never been removed. And in fact, SSH keys are probably the only credential that users in the default configuration can self-provision. They can grant access to, permanent access, to themselves or others, to any account that they can log into. And uh, that was originally designed to, so that they can, they can implement single sign-on without central coordination. But nowadays in regulated IT environments, or large enterprises, you want control. And you can, you can get that control with SSH, but you just have to configure it properly so that users cannot self-provision. But in open SSH, in the default configuration, you can. And most organizations have not changed that configuration. And as a result, result the sysadmins have been deploying keys for convenience for a long time, like an Oracle admin granting himself access to all the Oracle accounts in the enterprise, violating policy, bypassing privileged access management systems. And it's been built into all sorts of automated data transfers, application integrations, transaction processing, file transfers between, with business partners, with the supply chain, with the distribution channel, uh, even with financial organizations. It's, 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 it's just everywhere. So, so all I have to do is turn off self-provisioning, and that will fix the problem, right? Well, you still have to look after the legacy. So essentially, you need a controlled provisioning process. So you have to do the reconfiguration. You have to do an inventory of all the legacy keys that are out there. And we are finding that in most large enterprises, that's from several hundred thousand to million, several million credentials. And then you need to eliminate those credentials that are actually no longer needed or no, no longer used. We are finding that 90% of the keys are, aren't actually used anymore. And about 10% of them grant root access, the highest level of administrative access. And 
there are ways to get quick wins. So after the inventory, you want to monitor the environment so that you see which keys aren't actually used. So you eliminate that 90% with very little effort. That's a massive quick win and cost savings. And we provide tools for doing that. Then you identify those keys that violate policy, like access from test and development into production, which typically is a security issue because the development systems aren't secured the same way as production. And it's a, it's a compliance violation. It violates segregation of duties. And you, you want to eliminate access typically from interactive accounts into service accounts like the Oracle accounts I mentioned. So eliminating those policy violating keys is another big thing. And then you want to push the rest of the work to application teams because the application teams are the only ones who can decide which other applications should be they, uh, with, with, with what other applications should they be exchanging data with. So, so why would I care if you can get access to one machine and uh, once you get the keys, you can access those machines? What's the big problem? So the big problem is lateral spread of attacks. Hackers get into organizations all the time. Insiders do bad things all the time. And to keep the organization functioning, you need defense in depth. You need resilience. You need logical boundaries that stop the attack and help detect the attack. And uh, if you have credentials that are unmanaged, uncontrolled, there's a good chance that you'll be able to log in from one machine to another using those credentials to spread the attack and then use credentials on those machines to log into further machines. And we see them all the time being used to uh, to, to push data into disaster recovery data centers, to push data into backup systems. And those same connections could potentially be used to spread an attack between data centers or into backup systems. And it can be combined with, with local privilege escalation attacks. It can be combined on password sniffing attacks. I know there's still a lot of plain text telnet and FTP on Z series. And I see that as a massive risk from a lateral attack spread perspective. Hackers very often break into routers, for instance, and, and, and use routers to sniff on the traffic, to steal credentials. And if they can gain passwords to, uh, to ZOS, they can log in, exfiltrate data, corrupt data, or potentially destroy the data. And if done in a devious manner, it can take down the organization for weeks or months. What enterprise can tolerate the reputation damage coming from being down for weeks or months? Or the contractual penalties for late de de deliveries and so on. It could destroy billions of dollars of shareholder value in a Fortune 500 enterprise. It could actually kill the enterprise. It could kill a Fortune 500. So this, this sounds like it's very relevant to ZOS and ZOS people should care about this. Absolutely. In a lot of enterprises, the most critical data is on ZOS. The most critical business processes run on ZOS. So you have to protect those systems. It's a data economy. The value of the enterprise largely comes from the data it has and the processes that allow it to use that data effectively. And if those processes run on Z, you have to protect that or the enterprise goes down and the loss in shareholder value could be devastating. Yeah, these are the sort of things I'm hearing from customers as well. Uh, I had one, one customer tell me that they don't really care as much about the loss of data um, or the value. It's really more about the loss, the loss of reputation um, from an attack. And so like they would keep attacks secret for this very reason. Yep, I've heard the same. But it's also a sign of warfare issue. It's about resilience of the society at the same time. If, I mean, cyber warfare is all about intelligence, kind of 
covertly getting access to different systems, stealing credentials, establishing presence in secret, so that you can later bring down the systems if you want to, and, and do that to multiple enterprises in the society at the same time. And it could be highly effective in paralyzing a modern society. So that's also a risk. And it's a, it's a systemic risk, much bigger than the risk facing any single enterprise. So how do you properly mitigate this, this, uh, this risk? So you must have encryption. You must protect those credentials that grant access to the most critical resources in your organization. Telnet and FTP were eliminated from most environments already 10, 20 years ago. But we still see a surprising amount of use on ZOS. I find it mind-boggling. How can you have such weak protections for your most critical resources that could kill the enterprise? I, I... Like, how, can, how can auditors avoid including that in the risk, risk statements in the financial reports? If that can bring down the enterprise or cost billions of dollars in damage, I find it hard to believe. I don't think it can continue. You have to protect your most critical resources. And then for SSH keys, of course, you need to establish proper processes, same as you do for all other credentials, like passwords. You provision, you terminate, and if it's for automation, periodically you revalidate that the kind of application integration is still needed. It's pretty simple. Right. And then you have the legacy problem that you have to take care of for, for those more like the Unix Linux environments in, in, in large enterprises. Right, we're, we're all familiar with that. Uh, and, and this also affects yeah. cloud, by the way. Right. So, so, but for cloud, it's pretty easy because those are new systems and, and we have some very nice solutions for that. Right, and we're all familiar with password protections that we have today. We're, we're required to change our passwords or certain password links, adding characters, those sort of things. But really, I, I haven't seen as often these sort of things for SSH keys. Yeah, and it, the problem is not really about cryptographic keys. It's not about key sizes, so it's not, it's not about algorithms. It's about the access that's granted. Who has access to what? And you don't know. And yeah. most enterprises really do not know who has access to their servers using SSH keys because they've been, they haven't been audited by most auditors. They haven't really been recognized by cybersecurity management as something that they need to look into yet. We see with many customers they, that they, can, they have, many have five times more SSH keys than they have usernames and passwords. You can't ignore 80% of the credentials and put your head in the sand and pretend they don't exist. So if these keys are so bad, why would someone use them? It's the best, it's the best that's out there. I mean, passwords are great for some things, but you have to terminate the accounts when people leave. It's the same with keys. You have to terminate, remove the keys when people leave, and you have to change them periodically, and so on. Just, it's just about normal credentials management. Right. And they need to be managed same as every other credential. Right. It's more about improper management. Yeah. You need basic management processes. Um, could you tell me more about the compliance concerns with uh, improper key management? Well, every compliance regulation mandates that you must know who can access what. And you need to have effective authentication mechanisms. These days, at least in my opinion, if you transfer your credentials in the plain text for everybody to see, it's not, not particularly secure. In my opinion, that is not an effective authentication mechanism. And it's so easy to steal credentials from the network. I actually once wrote software to listen to network traffic, and steal credentials. It took me three hours from the scratch. And, 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 and there are like dozens of software packages available for doing that. And it's built into, into a lot of other tools. Wow, that's, that's pretty scary. So, and, and, and compliance also typically mandates segregation of duties, you cannot have your developers be able to change account balances in the bank, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or you don't want your, uh, your 
HVAC contractor to have access to patient data in a healthcare organization. So you definitely need to have those controls. They need to be effective and you must prevent jumping from server to server to spread an attack throughout the entire enterprise. Right. And in many cases, it's a requirement for uh, compliance. Yeah. Um, so is this an issue with all SSH implementations and platforms, or is it just certain platforms? It's not really specific to any particular product. But, for example, OpenSSH's default configuration has made it very easy to create new credentials. And that has led to the proliferation of the credentials in the enterprise, to actually having several million credentials in, in, in many enterprises. What sort of guidance would you give someone deploying SSH on ZOS? Well, first of all, make sure that it supports data sets and kind of all the data formats you need to support and characteristic conversions. And make sure that it integrates into the access management, key management systems used for managing SSH access in the rest of the enterprise. Because there's so much data transfer between Z ZOS and other systems. And those transfers are built into so many, so many file transfer tools, so many systems management tools, and you just need to transfer data effectively. So it, it, and, and, and you need, it need to manage access on both, both sides. If you, if you exchange data between applications, both teams have to cooperate and agree. And that's best done by one solution that covers the whole enterprise, ZOS, Unix, Cloud, and other. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think that'd be really great to, to have everything under one umbrella. Um, in, in closing, uh, what do you want to leave the audience with in regards to proper security and compliance governance? What keeps me awake at night is the risk of attack spread within the enterprise. In the servers, into the databases, into backup data centers, into disaster recovery. And two of the most effective ways to, do, do the, to spread are SSH keys, if they haven't been properly managed, and just plain text credentials, like plain text passwords with Telnet and FTP that can be used to penetrate into some of the most critical resources in the enterprise. That keeps me up in the night. That could destroy a Fortune 500. It could kill a Fortune 500. It could cause damage in billions. It could cause 30 billion of damage to shareholders of Fortune 500. And it could cause massive chaos in a society if used in a cyber warfare scenario. From what I've seen, 80% of corporate data is kept in ZOS today. And I've seen that 30% of people aren't using any encryption at all. That, that seems pretty scary for, for that, that amount of data and really no security at all. Yeah, I can't understand how that can be the case. I mean you'd think that you'd protect your, your most critical resources as much as you could. But for some reason, people are taking the risk. And when I think of cyber warfare, with fibers deciding what to prepare attack software for, I would certainly target the most critical resources whose loss causes the most damage to the targets I want to attack. Guess what that would be? <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. I, I agree with you. That's that's very scary and very interesting. Okay, well, Tatu, thank you for your time. It was a very interesting conversation. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to hand it off to Kali to talk more about our Universal Key Manager product. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tatu. So as John mentioned, right now we will jump into the introduction and demonstration of Universal SSH Key Manager. My name is Kalle Jaskelainen. I'm responsible of our solution management, product management at the SSH Communication Security. Let's start with a, a brief recap of what John and Tato just discussed. So there was a discussion about the SSH history and the more sp specifically the discussion about the SSH keys and how those are used as an access credentials. 
one of the challenges that we uh, that was mentioned on the interview is that these are maybe the only form of authentication credentials that the users can provision themselves without an oversight. Another problem is that those authentications actually never expire. And those authentication credentials, the SSH keys, cannot be reliably associated to an identity. And the problem is that this has, as mentioned, has grown over the years into a significant state that can no longer be ignored. So basically, SSH keys have been provisioned by users for, for a decade, a good decade and a half, without any governance or oversight in place. What we can do at SSH Communication Security to help our customers is to regain the compliance, mitigate the risk, and help our customers for the cost and operational efficiency. There are a couple of different stages to get things going. The first stage is to do a risk assessment. Risk assessment basically is a service where we help our customers to assess the state of their SSH environments, define the required policies, whether it's a compliance or internal uh, policies, identify the risks, requirements, and so forth. The second stage is to discover what's out there in the environment. Um, whether you have Windows, whether you have Linux, Unis, or IBM mainframes, we can discover the SSH keys in the environment and then basically mapping those um, keys into a trust maps and then able to identify who is able to connect and where. Combining the discovery process with the assessment, we are able to identify what portion of those keys and access credentials are violating different policies, what risks there are, and so forth. So kind of like comparing the desired state with the reality. Take the process forward with SSH Key Manager product, we can extend the reach into a three additional stages, monitor, remediate, and manage. Monitoring stage means that we are able to continuously monitor and scan the environment for any changes. You add new, new hosts and more machines, you remove machines, you add users, you add keys and so forth. So there's a continuous process to identify who's able to connect and where. There's also continuous monitoring to identify and react on any of the unauthorized changes and policy violations. The fourth stage is the remediation. So remediation means basically cleaning up the environment of all the policy violations, segregation of duties, unknown root access, unknown IBM user privileged accounts, and, and so forth. And then basically gain and show the policy and regulatory compliance for the um, whomever is interested of in it. After the remediation process, the last stage is to start managing the environment in an automated fashion. So we can integrate and automate the full li access lifecycle management of SSH uh, into your existing tools. So there's no need for administrators to go and do any manual work. All the processes of access provisioning, deprovisioning, or key rotation can be fully automated with the tool. Before jumping into the actual product demonstration, here's one more slide that we've built together with our key accounts. This mapping shows the risk versus the reward in the remediation efforts. So as you can see here, there on the, on the other axis, there is the risk mitigation reward, meaning that how valuable the risk mitigation effort is. And on the other axis, you can see the operation, possible operational risk of the remediation action. There are certain, let's say, low-hanging fruits that you can get resolved pretty easily and fast to show progress to your auditors, to whomever is uh, driving the project forward. There are clear policy violations such as segregation of duties, unauthorized trusts to privileged accounts, root, oracle, IBM user, and so forth. Um, clear policy violations are, are basically visible whenever people are bypassing the jump servers or the existing privileged access management solutions leveraging SSH keys. There are lots of uh, decommissioned application keys, decommissioned trust, trusts, servers, applications, so forth. A good majority of the key material that is out there in the environments is actually unused and obsolete. So those are keys and access credentials that are there 
in the environment just waiting for someone to remove those but as as we, we know it's a manual process so no one actually never done that so those are just credentials that are sitting there still providing even privileged access that shouldn't no longer be there then of course as we go forward in the process we need to identify whether the trusts are unknown or actually known by third parties or in internal users um, there are keys that have been aged, so basically keys that are over five years old should be definitely rotated. There are keys with weak, weak algorithms, weak key sizes, and so forth that should be rotated as well. So there are uh, lots of things that we can do around SSH access management across the Windows, Unix, and ZOS to help you to mitigate the risk, regain the compliance, and at the end of the day, improve the operational and cost efficiency. And now jumping to the product demonstration. So basically here we can see the graphical user interface of the Universal SSH Key Manager. All the functions we do here on the graphical user interface, you can also do through the REST API and with the command line tools. Um, to follow up the process of the assessment, discovery, monitoring, remediation and manage, the first thing you want to do is to uh, set up your policies. One of the things that the product has is a policy engine where you can define that what kind of policies you want to have in your environment, what is the desired state, how you want your environment to look like. Um, so you define a policy, segregation of duties, unused keys, key ages, cryptographic policies, duplicate private keys, and, and so forth. Uh, the tool actually with the continuous monitoring, it tracks the, the policy violations, so you can have a histogram over time that show the progress uh, or or the lack of progress um, on of your environment so stage one you define your policies how you want your environment to look like the second stage is that we do the discovery process the discovery process can be done using the three different methods so we provide an agent that is typically just used on the uh, windows workstations we provide a fully agentless discovery model as well as uh, management operations that are typically used for the uh, Linux Unix environments and also on the ZOS mainframe. So I do have one of the LPARs scanned here as well. Um, the third option here is the 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 third option is the script-based scanning. So basically, we just provide a script the customer can run in their environment using their Chef, Puppet, Ansible. Uh, blade logic, whatever kind of provisioning tools they have in place, they import all the information to the um, tool and you get a visibility using a third party tools. So you attach your hosts into the environment and basically once you start discovering more, of course, the more policy violations you will find, the more information you will find and get into the environment. And this is part of the part of the assessment service so part of the assessment service we also do a reporting capabilities so you can have the full environment report a sage policy based reporting with all the fancy histograms as well as the application team based report so if you want if you have a several application teams you can have a uh, separate reports for the application users at, right after the discovery process, whatever the um, method was and, and is, you're basically able to gain a full visibility into the keys with all the possible um, information available. So there is a lot of information that you can gather out of the keys, um, out of the private keys, authorized keys, and the trust maps. So whatever your compliance needs and reporting needs are, probably the information will be in the tool. So it's more of just deciding what kind of information you want to have there and then pull that into your own reporting services, either through the web UI or API calls. Um, following the process of the remediation. So one of the things is that you kind of a connect to the environment, you discover, you start monitoring the environment for any unauthorized changes. So if there are some private keys that have appeared to the environment without any governance. Uh, if there are any private keys that have become missing, for example, the user has removed keys um, with the manual operation, we're able to detect all these deviations and we're able to push in the policy desired state back in place. Um, 
there is a concept of applications in the tool. So in many, many environments, even if the tool is owned by, let's say, a security or a compliance, um, you need to get the application teams involved. The application teams can be based on the application, file transfers, oracles, or those can be uh, per platform. So you may have an application team for covering the ZOS mainframes and Unix, Linux, Wintel, and so forth. So you can fully configure the applications, who is the owner of it, what's the purpose of it, what kind of a, a, a keys and what kind of accounts, systems, and so forth are belonging to that application. When we go into the remediation process, the user or the administrator of the tool can of course go here and, and let me just select a few keys here out of the random, just pick a few here, and then I can just go here and go and remove those. So being an administrator uh, with full access rights here on my demo system, I can basically remove keys, add keys, and do all kinds of magic um, in the environment. However, on real customer environments, probably the application teams will not allow a, a security guy to go there and touch their applications. That's why we've had a, a, we have developed another user interface called User Portal. The user portal is a streamlined user portal is a streamlined portal for the end users. So let me just kind of say login. There you go. And while logging in, basically I've defined that okay, Bob is an owner of a selected applications, and Bob doesn't see the full estate. He doesn't see all these um, uh, all the keys, but Bob only sees his portion and his part of the application. So let me just kind of go to the Oracle application, and then basically I can see the visibility and information of the Oracle application. Um, if you remember from the key manager um, policy dashboard, basically um, we define these policies of restricted root access, segregation of duties, unused keys, and so forth. So the policies are also visible for the end users in a very easy to understand way. So basically the end users, don't, don't, they don't have to know about SSH or the, all the complexities um, of the SSH and SSH keys. All they have to know is that, okay, my application is violating certain policies. What is the description of it? What's the possible impact? And what is the recommended action? Should these be removed, rotated, and so forth? So basically the application teams, let's be just going to call it, for example, go to the key age. I know that, okay, on the key age, there are three private keys in violation of this policy. I can just click there, I can go there, and based on the recommendation that was uh, to rotate the keys, I can just kind of say, go there, okay, there are a couple of renewals already pending in my environment. I can just kind of say, go there and renew it, how, what kind of a key I want to create. Okay, I want to create an RSA, RSA 4K uh, key out of this. I can get all the details, I can see all the details if I want to, but the, the, the idea here is that the policy requirement was to renew the key. So um, basically, now I'm all set, I submit the actions, and you can have one or more la more layers of approvers, uh, cross, cross application approvers, security approvers, compliance approvers, uh, whatever the approval process will be, and only whenever the approval process has been completed, the um, jobs will get executed on the on the desired state, or then uh, whenever there is a maintenance window scheduled for that specific environment, you can also schedule those uh, only uh, valid for those um, those environments and time periods. So this is part of the remediation process. So application owners, business users, um, they can go and use the portal, take care of their own domain. And at the end of the day, hopefully the, the situation gets remediated and the amount of policy violating keys will become smaller and the reports will look nicer to, uh, to whomever is um, required to present and show those to the upper management. What comes to the automation of the workflows, so I kind of already showed the removal of the keys. So I can just kind of say go and remove any of those keys and access credentials, but I can also add authorizations the same way. So I can just go here and add, 
let's say, okay, um, Bob from Linux 100 um, should be able to access a, a, let's say, Linux 103 as an Oracle account, as an example. So you can do one-to-one, -one, one to many many-to-many -many mappings. You're able to enforce restrictions um, and so forth to kind of feel like really tied up the security and then just authorize. And what the tool does is that we just connect to all of the endpoints, either using agent or agent-based discovery. And then basically we create the keys on behalf of the user. We provision the public keys and so forth. So no manual operation needed at all. Um, one important, very important thing to remember here when we talk about SSH Key Manager is that we never require users to transfer the private keys into a centralized vault. So the private keys and the authorized keys are always at the endpoints. We just manage them, we just control them, we just lock them down. So even if the key manager is, let's say, shut down for, for maintenance, the business processes keep on running exactly as before. So the systems are still connecting exactly as before from A to B, from B to C, for interactive and M2M connectivity. We just manage all those access credentials uh, from in a centralized fashion. So we do not interrupt any of the existing processes with our operations. Um, as said, a lot of the customers uh, are leveraging our API as well. So a lot of the customers, they do start with the user interface. And then whenever they kind of they get familiar with the product, familiar with the discovery process, they will start integrating this universal SSH key manager into their existing approval processes. Very common ITSM tools, service nows, work days, and so forth. Uh, so universal key manager is part of the access provisioning and deprovisioning process. Another very common integration point is all these uh, identity repositories, uh, active directories, and so forth to really kind of uh, map the keys and the accounts into an identity. So if Joe leaves a company, we know where Joe had access, so we're able to react and remove all the Joe's keys that he's no longer able to connect. So this is a very short introduction to the SSH key manager. So the product very much follows the process of figuring out the assessment, doing the discovery process of all the, all the keys, um, continuous monitoring of the environment due the periodic scanning uh, structures, and then helping our customers to remediate the situation into the polydefined state. And then at the end of the day, automate the full lifecycle management of SSH keys. Um, I hope you found the demonstration um, useful. And uh, if there's any questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And um, thank you.